Hello everyone and welcome to the Lost Episode Creepypasta Iceberg Part 3. This will be the final single part and the next video will be the complete iceberg. Lost Episode Creepypastas are pretty popular and there are a lot that I've never heard of. At this point you know what a Lost Episode Creepypasta is and you know what an iceberg video is. As we enter the depths, expect the stories to get more obscure, more dark, and hopefully more disturbing. Before we start, consider subscribing if you like these kinds of videos, and be sure to check out part 1 and 2 as well. Now, let's get to the video. This is the Lost Episode Creepypasta Iceberg, Part 3. The author of this story finds a strange episode of Scooby-Doo on Netflix. The episode in question was newer, from a series that aired in the early 2000s. He didn't recognize it because he'd only ever seen the original Scooby-Doo episodes, but put it on for his kids. The episode starts with the gang winning a trip to the Scooby Snack Factory. The way in which they won the trip was through Shaggy finding a single box-sized Scooby Snack in his box of snacks. The gang then tweeted about it and were invited to the factory. After that tweet went viral. The plot sounds silly enough for a kid's cartoon, but it was odd since the show shouldn't have been airing when tweeting was a thing. At least, not that the author was aware of. Either way, this episode seemed oddly familiar to another one he'd seen them watch a week prior. The gang then proceeds to the factory, and that's when the author realizes how boring this episode was. The characters didn't make any jokes, nor was there anyone with a pun for a name. It was just a very boring and formal tour of a factory. The author walked around the house doing chores and only catching glimpses of the show, until they walked in and saw a dead body on screen. Now, he was sure something was going on with this episode. Scooby-Doo had some dark episodes, but they'd never shown a dead body before. According to the author's kids, this was actually the second dead body to appear in the episode. The author decided to watch the rest of the episode without his kids. They left and went to their room to play. Fred was the dead body they'd found. It didn't make sense to kill a main character, especially not in a kid's cartoon. The episode continued with Shaggy and Scooby eating comically oversized sandwiches. Scooby said he wasn't hungry, so Shaggy gave him a weird purple Scooby snack. Eating it, his face and demeanor seemed to change instantly. Next scene was Daphne and Vilma walking around the factory. They eventually ran into Scooby, who had a giant bulbous stomach now. There's a pile of Scooby snacks next to him, with Shaggy's arm sticking out of it. Daphne grabbed the arm and when she tugged on it, the arm came out without the rest of Shaggy. They immediately blamed Scooby, who told them he didn't, before eating another purple Scooby snack and then attacking Daphne. Velma called in security, and they were able to wrestle Scooby away from the now bleeding out Daphne. Velma then reached behind Scooby's head and started to pull up the mask. The mask finally gave way and revealed the author's face. The author turned his head, and the head in the cartoon mimicked his movements. He was dumbstruck. How was any of this happening? Vilma then reached behind his head again and started to pull. The author felt something clawing at the back of his neck before he shut the TV off. The feeling stopped, and he took a moment to collect himself. Later, the author was searching Reddit to see if anyone knew of the episode, and most couldn't identify it at all. He almost didn't believe it himself, but the scars on the back of his neck are proof enough that it exists and it's out there somewhere. While watching Samurai Jack late at night, the author sees a strange broadcast. It was on Adult Swim, so it could have been like some of their other odd late night programming. Like this house has people in it, or unedited footage of a bear. The only difference is the show seemed very low quality, unlike the other shows mentioned. The show had five people sitting on a couch, watching the camera as if it were a TV. It seemed so odd that these people were just watching TV and having pretty mundane conversations. Eventually, each of the five people slowly left the room for whatever reason. When they were all gone, the only sound that could be heard was the TV, which sounded like it was playing Samurai Jack, which is what the author wished he was watching. After a few moments of nothing, a silhouette of a man seemed to fade in at the corner of the screen. His body was made of static and he was standing behind the couch and facing directly at the camera. A moment later, two girls walked on screen. One of them was yelling at the other, saying that you did it and I can't believe you killed him. 
Then, the one yelling picked up an axe and brought it down on the other girl's head. The other girl rushed in and pulled the weapon from the girl and pinned her to the ground. Then it just ended. The author wrote it off as an edgy short film and went to bed. The next day, the author searched his social media to see if anyone else was talking about the short film, but he couldn't find anything. No one else seemed to have watched it. Or at least the people he followed didn't. Even his friends had all gone to sleep before it would have aired, so that meant it was just him that had seen it. A week later, the author awoke to the sound of firefighters outside of his door. He walked over and asked them what they were doing. The firefighter explained that someone had hooked up their laptop to this pole and broadcast something out to the neighborhood. And they were there to remove the excess wires they'd left behind. The author left and went straight back to their house. He decided to skim through the newspaper and see if he could find the strange broadcast again, and found something interesting. He found an article about a murder that had recently happened. The case had many similarities to the broadcast he'd seen, including the amount of people in the house and the mention of someone else being murdered. Later, a friend contacted the author saying they'd seen the broadcast and had actually recorded it. His friend, named Randall, wanted him to come over to his place and watch it. When he got there, Randy invited him in and told him to keep the lights off since he had a hangover. The author thought this was odd, but went inside anyway. They watched it together and confirmed it was what they had seen. The author then took the tape and started to make his own copy, but after trying to watch his copy, it didn't work. The tape would just stop at the part where it cut away from the Samurai Jack episode. The author decided to go back to Randy's house and give him back his tape, but found his door locked and his car gone. A moment later, he received a phone call from Randy. Randy explains to him how he should just stop looking into the broadcast. Randy then said, he spoke to me before hanging up. Ren and Stimpy is a gross-out cartoon that aired on Nickelodeon. It was also the favorite show of the author of this story. He explains his home life is not great, as his parents always fought. One Christmas, he received an episode compilation of Ren and Stimpy on DVD from his dad. The DVD featured some of the better episodes from the show, and a brand new episode. The new episode was listed as a special feature on the case. The DVD menu was what you'd expect from a collection. It had Ren and Stimpy written everywhere, and had taken screenshots from the show as the backgrounds. The author wasted no time in selecting the new episode and starting it. The thumbnail for the new episode had Ren looking scared while staring up at something. The episode started with Ren waking up and heading downstairs for breakfast. He appeared to be in a foul mood. Stimpy was preparing food and told Ren that he should make some coffee before eating. The pair sat down to eat, and Ren devoured his food before getting up to leave. Stimpy asked why he didn't help him with the dishes. Ren yelled at Stimpy about how it was his turn to do the dishes. Stimpy looked upset at this, but continued doing the dishes anyway. After the dishes were done, Stimpy went to grab some money so he could go shopping. Ren caught him and yelled at him about how it's too early to go shopping and that he needed to prepare lunch at 12. The screen cut to Ren watching TV. He looked at his clock and saw that it was lunchtime. He called out to Stimpy to ask if he'd started lunch yet, but got no reply. He walked into the kitchen and saw that he wasn't there either. He kept calling out to him before making his way towards Stimpy's room. Ren found Stimpy curled up in the corner. He walked over to his friend and was about to yell at him again, but stopped. Stimpy turned around and he looked different. He looked like a demonic cat with real sharp teeth and sharp claws. He looked irate. Stimpy slowly walked towards Ren. Ren backed away, but not before Stimpy swiped at him and cut his cheek. The claw marks were deep, and the blood flowed in a more realistic way than cartoons usually showed. Ren asked him why, and Stimpy replied, You made me do this. For all the harassment, all the yelling, all the bullying. You're going to get what you deserve. Ren gets knocked out by Stimpy, and wakes up tied to a chair in the kitchen. Stimpy then cuts him with a knife, exposing the inside of his stomach. Ren falls from the chair to the floor. The episode then ends with Stimpy throwing Ren into the grave and saying, Dirt like you belongs to the ground. Thomas and Friends was a show that began airing in 1984 and has been extremely popular with children. The author of this story used to work on the show and loved doing so. Up until they switched from Thomas and Friends to 
Thomas and Friends Big World Adventures. The author states that they still worked on the show, but only on some special ones that focused on Edward and Henry. While searching for some files at work, the author noticed a file titled Thomas and the Unfinished Bridge, Restricted. This puzzled the author, who had never heard of this episode before. When he clicked on it, he found it was password protected. The author questioned their boss about the file and was told it was a cancelled episode that was set to air as the finale of the second season. When he pressed further, his boss said the episode contained stuff too graphic for children and that the creator was fired, which left the episode in its cancelled state. A tape was created, but it was stolen, possibly by the person who created the episode. The author states that he is a very curious person, and he couldn't sleep knowing a never-before-seen episode of the show that he worked on was out there somewhere. So they started an online search for anything related to the episode. After a bit of searching, he decided to check eBay and actually found someone selling a VHS tape with the same name. It took eight days for the tape to arrive, and when it did, the author went right to watching it. The episode started with Thomas on a passenger trip. The scene was pretty average, and the quality was normal for the second season, except there was no narration. The episode began to pick up speed when Thomas found his brakes weren't working, and he blew through a train station at full speed. The music was picking up, but still no narration to go along with it. The music that played was the kind that would typically play in these tense situations in the show. Thomas kept gaining speed and passed a sign that said Unfinished Bridge. The camera panned out to show how close Thomas was to the end of the tracks. Finally, the conductor was able to get the brakes working again and told Thomas to apply them. Thomas smiled and began to speed up. The next scene showed the passenger car full of people who were screaming. The screams continued as Thomas plunged over the side of the unfinished bridge and crashed on the rocks below. The video cut to static for 10 seconds before coming back to a man cutting the face off of Thomas's train. He threw Thomas's face onto a flatbed that was immediately picked up by a giant claw and thrown into an incinerator. The face melted with Thomas smiling. And that's the end of the creepypasta. But for some reason, there's an aftermath section that ruins the entire story. The author writes that they then uploaded the video to YouTube, and it got 50,000 views and more than 100 comments, which is kind of a weird way to end your story. Firstly, the story wasn't amazing by any means, but this ruins all believability. The idea of finding a creepy prototype of an unaired episode at work is cliche, but still interesting. Saying you then uploaded it to YouTube and it went semi-viral, when you never did, is kind of lame. Without that ending, it's not that bad. With the ending, it's cringy at best. The Loud House is a very popular cartoon on Nickelodeon. It stars a boy named Lincoln as he has to manage a life where he is both the middle child and the only boy in the family. He has five older sisters and five younger sisters. Loud House Enough is Enough is about Lincoln going on a sadistic, murderous rampage and killing all of his siblings before killing himself. There's not much more to say than that, as each section of the story is just about how he kills each of his sisters. The first sister, Luann, the one that wants to be funny, ends up not actually being dead, ends up also killing herself for some reason. This last episode of Creepypasta just reads like a strange fan fiction, like cupcakes but without the extreme gore. The Creepypasta is being reworked on the website, so I guess I'll come back to it when the author is done rewriting it. For now, it's pretty generic, but kind of fun to read if you have nothing better to do. Stick Stickly may be one of the least creative characters ever made, but he still holds a very special place in the hearts of 90s children for his several years of hosting Nick in the afternoon. Most information on Stick Stickly says he hosted Nickelodeon's summer afternoon block from 1995 to 1998, but I always swore that I remember seeing him on TV earlier than that. I thought I was crazy for quite a while, but recently I found a small fan site for Stick Stickly that mentioned him hosting a 1993 afternoon block during the school year called Afternoon Snack with Stick Stickly. To my joy, the website even had videos of Stickly's segments. I watched one marked First Ever Stick Stickly Appearance. Stick Stickly was in front of a chalkboard with Afternoon Snack written on it in normal writing. His design was a little different. His eyes were smaller, he had no nose, 
and his mouth was a straight line instead of being curved into a smile. He made a couple of corny jokes, then said Rugrats was coming up next. The video ended at that point. I moved on to the second episode, which was called Stick Gets Injured. Stick Stickly had the same face from the first video, but his body seemed a little worn. There were a few splinters sticking out of his side. Stick Stickly then said, Well, the dog next door buried me, but I managed to get it. The show you all voted to see, Hey Dude, is up next. And don't forget to send in your postcards to vote for the special guest you want to see. And remember, that address is... Redacted. He sang the classic song about writing to him, but the tune was different than in later versions, much slower. After he sang the song, he just stood motionless for a few minutes before the video ended. The third was called Hang Stick. Stick Stickly was hanging in the air by a piece of string tied around his waist. A little boy who looked about five was also there. The chalkboard had six dashes on it, representing a six-letter hangman word. The kid was guessing letters, and each time he got one wrong, the string around Stick's waist would move higher. The game would be over when it reached Stick's neck. The kid kept guessing letters, and when the rope was one incorrect guess from Stick's neck, the letters filled in were C, N, D, L, and E. It was obvious what the word was, but the kid wasn't taking the game very seriously. Giggling, he guessed X. The rope moved to Stick's neck and his eyes flashed out of existence and were replaced by two X's. There was no sound for about 30 seconds. The kid stared at Stick's body, then Stick's eyes flashed back to normal and he laughed. Said he was fine and that Wild and Crazy Kids was on next. The fifth video was marked Stick Gets Mad, No Sound. Like the description said, it was silent. Stick was moving very quickly, with body language indicating he was yelling. A little girl was cowering from him, clearly afraid. The girl eventually left and Stick just faced the screen. His animation was so simple that I couldn't tell if he was talking. The sixth video was called The Winner Revealed. Stick had a dark red stain on the top of his head and one of his eyes was an X. Stick made no mention of his appearance and announced that the votes were in it was time for the special guest show to air. His last bit of dialogue was, It's been a long contest and the vote was close, but you, the kids have decided. Coming right now, the classic you all voted for, Candle Cove. There's at least one creepypasta per section of this iceberg that's just entirely a cliché. The way they are written makes it sound like they were a genuine attempt at a story and not a troll pasta. Cold is a SpongeBob SquarePants Lost episode creepypasta in every way. The author finds a videotape at a yard sale containing only two episodes of SpongeBob, one that the author knew in a brand new episode he'd never seen before. The author takes the tape home and puts it in the VHS player. The episode is called Cold and has a noose hanging in the background of the title card. It wasn't even the episode that was advertised. The episode starts with Spongebob and Patrick talking outside. The two then get into an argument before both storming off. The weirdest part was that the two had exchanged profanities before doing so. Later, Patrick is sitting in a bathtub with cuts on his arms. He appears to be lifeless before his eyes go black and he emerges from the bathtub. He grabs a shotgun and runs over to Spongebob's house. Spongebob opens the door and sees Patrick aiming the gun at his face. The two exchange a few more profanities before Patrick shoots Spongebob. His body fell limply to the floor and Patrick began to laugh a very deep laugh. The episode ended with a few more gory scenes of Spongebob before transitioning to a hanging Sandy for the remainder of the runtime. Jigsaw BBC was a BBC television series that started in 1979. It was pretty popular and spawned a character that horrified many who viewed it. His name was Nosy Bonk, and he was made to entertain children. The creepypasta has a man who worked on the show talk about an unaired final episode that one of his co-workers worked on. The episode was strange, but it wasn't until after he'd snuck back into the viewing room to watch it by himself that he saw what it really was. The episode had Nosy Bonk sitting at a dinner table with a long knife resting on the table. The whole episode was in black and white for some reason. Nosy Bonk placed his head on the table before staring at the screen for a while. The episode then shifts to weird edits of Nosy Bonk from the regular show. They were edited together in a jarring way. Nosy Bonk would stare at the screen with low murmuring playing in the background. 
Eventually, the murmuring turned to screams. The author left the studio after the episode ended and threw the tape in the trash on his way out. AFV Lost Episode is about a man who receives a strange email from a friend. The email came from a friend who had a passion for finding weird and disturbing things. So they expected the email to contain something of that sort. Their email had a video attached, which appeared to be an episode of America's Funniest Home Videos. The author's friend said that they found an episode of America's Funniest Home Videos playing on a strange channel that seemed to work randomly. They recorded some of the episode on their cell phone and sent it in the email. The episode appeared to take place on Christmas, as the host was wearing a Santa costume. The show seemed a little off as there was no live audience. The host seemed pretty normal during the beginning of the show. As the actual clip started playing though, everything seemed wrong. The first clip was of a Christmas tree catching fire. The second clip had a nail gun accidentally firing off and hitting someone in the head. Another clip had someone falling off the roof of a house while putting up Christmas lights. The theme of the episode seemed to be showing clips from submissions that seemed to be too graphic for normal viewing. But even so, these were way too graphic. The show ended without the usual fan voting. The host said goodnight, and then it ended. The author's friend searched the channel again and found that it had other similar American TV shows. If she clicked info on the show that was playing, it would immediately stop working. A serious Godzilla fan comes across a strange copy of the movie Godzilla vs. Destroya in 1996. The movie had just been released in Japan and the only way to get a copy was to buy it straight from a Japanese distributor, which meant the author had to buy their copy from overseas. The VHS tape took a while to get to the author, but when it did arrive, he wasted no time watching it. The author noticed some differences in this copy and the one he'd seen prior. The first scene of the movie was on Birth Island and not in Hong Kong. Godzilla is watching over his son as he explores the island. Godzilla then grasps at his chest as it pulses. Godzilla lets out a scream as the screen goes white. The film then starts in Hong Kong again. This part of the movie is pretty normal, save for some missing sound effects here and there. Everything seems to be pretty close to the original until the antagonist of the film, Destroya, shows up. The scene where Destroya picks up Godzilla's child is a bit different. Godzilla Jr. starts flailing around and shooting off his atomic breath. Destroya then throws Godzilla Jr. straight into the ground with a sickening crunch. The camera zooms in on a twitching Godzilla Jr. He starts to foam at the mouth as he struggles to move from where he is indented into the ground. A few moments later, Godzilla Jr. stops moving altogether. The movie then shows Destroya kill Godzilla by throwing him through a building and then shooting a beam of energy at him. The movie doesn't end there, however. The final scene is Destroya killing the JSDF forces as they show up to fight the beast. There exists a bootleg episode of Spongebob. Other than this image, the rest of the video is composed of incomprehensible jumbles of colors, static, or just black screens. The audio seems to be a heavily distorted version of the audio from the original episode, with loud, droning buzzes occasionally interrupting it. The bootleg tape itself was found by a group of five urban exploring teenagers in a trash can within an abandoned mental institution. Of these five individuals, two have committed suicide, one has gone missing, one refuses to comment on the tape, and the last hastily agreed to give paranormal investigators the tape shortly after being interviewed about the suicide and disappearances of the other three people. The current whereabouts of the tape are unknown, and many who stare at this image for a long enough period of time claim to see Spongebob blink. If you stare at this image long enough, he will blink. The teenager that's gone missing was found dead in a dustbin a year later after the discovery of the tape. I myself am one of the people that witnessed the incident. I was chilling at home one night scrolling through channels on the remote and found that an episode of Spongebob was airing on Nick. I was bored at the time because I didn't know what to do that would keep me entertained, so I decided to watch it. The episode that was on was Your Shoes Untied slash Gary Takes a Bath, though I believe I missed part of this first episode. 
I continued watching, but I noticed something odd. When Patrick said, hey, SpongeBob, after SpongeBob tripped in the Krusty Krab, SpongeBob wouldn't move. He wouldn't even reply. He just laid there. Patrick was confused at this. SpongeBob, he asked. But SpongeBob didn't reply. He just laid there on the floor as the camera zoomed in on him. Then SpongeBob got up for a split second twice, which made it look like he was gasping for air. He continued to stay on SpongeBob's body until cutting to static after a few minutes. Now, I've seen this episode a million times, but this wasn't in it. It cuts to SpongeBob laying on the floor, but he's now in the kitchen at the Krusty Krab. A few seconds later, it cut to SpongeBob's body in a black room, floating in the air in a different direction, but in the same pose. Then it immediately cut to SpongeBob and Gary sitting in the huge shoe at the end of the episode, while Gary slightly moved up and down while a weird distorted music track played in the background. After a few more seconds, it cut to static, and then went black. After a minute of nothing but the black screen, the episode Gary Takes a Bath started playing. The episode started out pretty normal, but halfway through the episode, there was a split second scene of SpongeBob in a distorted visual with Gary. They were just staring at the screen, smiling creepily, and then cut to static again. I was confused if this was even the real episode or just some glitch. I tried shutting it off and turning it back on, but the episode stayed the same. I decided to just turn off the TV and went to bed. The next morning, I went and turned on the TV and saw that everything was back to normal. To this day, I still have so many questions about this drug trip of an episode. Was I having a bad dream? Was the TV hijacked? To this day, I still don't know what the heck was going on at the time. It's been a couple of years since the incident, I still don't have any answers, or even after searching through the internet for hours on end. To this day, no one knows how this incident occurred, or who or what caused it but I am determined to find this out for myself. One of these days, this mystery will be solved. I usually like to watch TV with my little sister, Kimberly. She was only five, so of course she watched all the cutesy kids shows. I didn't really mind though. They made her happy and I like spending time with her. She watched shows like Dora, Blue's Clues, and Arthur. We often had a lot of DVDs of old kids shows running around the house that we would watch occasionally. There was a large box of old movies and TV shows in the attic. I took a brief look at it once, but none of them looked like they would appeal to her. One day, Kimberly was at a doctor's appointment and I thought I'd have time to watch a movie aimed more towards my age range. So I thought this would be a good time to look through the box of old movies in the attic. While I looked through the box, I noticed that these movies didn't really interest me, but I kept looking in hopes of finding something. Then I saw at the bottom of the box, a DVD labeled, Colwyn's Corner. Many memories started to come back to me. I used to watch this show as a kid. It was about an orange puppet named Colwyn who lived in a house on the corner of the street. He would often have his other puppet friends come over to play games and sing songs. It was cute and innocent, and I remember really liking it as a kid. I thought this would be a good show for my sister and I to watch. When Kimberly got home, I told her I got a new show for us to watch. She got excited and sat down on the couch while I put the disc in. I sat down next to her as the selection screen popped up. The screen looked just as I remembered. It showed Colin and his friends in front of the house. I chose the first episode and the theme song began. I was a little confused. The colors were a lot darker than I remember and the song was sung a lot slower and in a deeper voice. I didn't think much of it as I hadn't seen the show in a long time and I probably forgot some elements of it. The show began pretty normally. Colin was in his house and said hello to the viewers. There was a knock on his door and he said, I think my friends are here. When he opened the door, I felt my heart go to my throat. Standing at the door were two tall white puppets with no nose or mouth, only pitch black eyes. I was shocked because I don't even remember these characters on the show. Even the cover of the DVD showed two colorful friendly puppets. I looked over at Kimberly and she had this big smile on her face. I was confused since an image like this would terrify a child. I'm not sure if we should watch this anymore, I told her. No, please keep it on, she exclaimed. I continued watching as the giant puppets didn't seem to phase her. The two larger puppets came into the house. Colin asked, what do you guys want to do today? The one puppet replied with the most horrific sound it ever heard. It sounded like a man was shouting almost screaming in a strange language. The audio was very distorted. At this point, I got up and ejected the disc from the player. 
much to Kimberly's disappointment. Why did you stop it? Put it back on, she said. I didn't listen and put the DVD in a drawer. Even though Kimberly wasn't bothered by the show, I still thought it was too disturbing for a five-year-old. I had trouble sleeping that night. I kept thinking about the video. I watched that show all the time when I was younger. I definitely have seen every episode. I didn't understand why I didn't remember an episode like this. I was still curious about the rest of the episode. I decided to go downstairs to finish it. I took the DVD out of the drawer and put it back into the player. I put on my headphones so the noise wouldn't disturb my family. The episode began the same, with the strange intro and the large puppets. After the one puppet made the terrifying sound, Colin replied, you're right, we should play a game. He then grabbed a knife off the counter. It cuts to a live action arm painted orange to represent Colin's. The knife went up to the arm and started to cut slits, each one deeper than the last. Colwyn started to scream, a blood-curdling scream. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I felt sick to my stomach. Blood gushed out of the wounds as the screams got louder and louder. It cuts to a live-action neck-painted orange. The knife went up to the throat and cut a deep slit in it. The blood began gushing out. It showed Colin gasping heavily for air before his eyes turned completely white. The episode ended with him falling onto the floor as the two tall, white puppets looked directly at the camera with pitch black eyes. I was utterly terrified at this point. I immediately ejected the DVD and threw it in the trash. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I kept thinking about that episode. I got up the next morning and went downstairs to get some breakfast. I walked past Kimberly's room and saw that she wasn't in there. When I got downstairs, I saw her on the couch finishing up the horrific episode I watched last night. I immediately grabbed the remote and turned off the TV. Why did you do that? She asked. Where did you get the DVD? It was in the garbage, she replied. I took it out because I wanted to finish the episode. This show is very bad, I said. No, no it's not. They were just baking a cake. What? The episode is about Colin and his friends baking a cake. I was shocked. What did his friends look like, I asked. One was blue and one was red, she replied. I really liked it. Can I watch it again? My Poor Stimpy is supposed to be the last episode of the show ever created for Nickelodeon. It was created by the original creator in every aspect. He wrote the episode, animated, and even did the voice work. The episode was so bad that it caused the show to be pulled and never aired on Nick ever again. The episode starts with Ren receiving an autographed vinyl in the mail. He places the vinyl on the mantle and tells Stimpy not to mess with it. Ren then punched Stimpy in the stomach and told him never go near it. This scene ended with Stimpy on the ground crying while looking up at the record. In a later scene, Stimpy accidentally threw a ball through the window, almost hitting the record. While climbing up the mantle to get his ball, he falls and brings the record down with him. Ren then enters to see what had caused the noise and finds Stimpy on the ground with his now broken record. The scene then zooms in on Ren's face as pure hatred burns in his eyes. The sound of Stimpy crying could be heard as the scene cut to black. A final scene showed Ren sitting on the couch watching TV with a random black mass in the corner of the room. The camera zoomed in until you could see that it was Stimpy's mangled corpse lying in the corner with the pieces of the broken record all around him. In the Night Garden was a British television show created for young children. The creepypasta supposes a true sad backstory to the show, one in which the author claims to be dark and depressing. The show starts with a child out to sea with a little light and a blanket for a sail. This always struck the author as being a little odd. The child was also blue for some reason. The creepypasta then goes on to explain the characters in the show in relation to the real world. Like the main kid's best friend being a girl named Upsy Daisy because his best friend in the real world is named Daisy. This is because the whole world of the show takes place inside the kid's mind. He's imagining it to escape his terrible home life where his parents drink and use drugs. They have no love for their son, but they do drop him off at a daycare every day. The daycare is where he gets most of the ideas for his adventures. Each person he meets relates to a character in the show. The old man that comes to the nursery to read to the kids is actually the narrator of the show. One day, the kid's father comes to pick him up, but instead of going home, they drive to the beach. At the beach, the kid is picked up and wrapped in his blanket before being placed in a wooden boat. 
The father pushes his kid out to sea. The little boy, wrapped in his favorite blanket, slowly turns blue as hyperthermia takes him. The author grew up just outside of Toronto. His parents had left him the house and were moving but asked him to check to see if they'd left anything behind in the basement. In the basement is where he found a VHS tape labeled Frankie Pig Visits Niagara Falls. The tape was found in a box labeled Kids Movies. The box had other movies that the author remembered, like VeggieTales, Peter Pan, and the Berenstain Bears. This movie though, the author didn't remember ever watching. The synopsis on the back of the box read, From the studio that brought you Frankie Pig's Big Adventure, Canada's favorite farm friend is back in a feature-length adventure. When Farmer Casey lets the farm animals go on a vacation, troublemaking Frankie Pig decides to jump ship at Niagara Falls, making friends and learning lessons as he tries to find Farmer Casey and the others. The movie seemed innocent enough. The author decides to watch it and see if maybe he'd just forgotten it for some reason. He pulled out a VHS player and inserted the tape. The movie starts with a woman, probably Farmer Casey, talking to the camera about how the animals are going on vacation. She then asks the viewers to help wake up each of the animals, except for Frankie, who they find hiding in a puddle of mud. So far the film is a pretty standard childhood affair. The farm animals and Farmer Casey are traveling around Canada and visiting their famous landmarks. They go over the history of each landmark as they visit them. When the crew gets to Niagara Falls is when everything changes. As soon as Frankie Pig separates from the group, the cute animated pig turns into a real man wearing a distorted pig mask. The man still spoke like he was being voiced by a young child. Only this time the child sounded like he was reading his lines while trying not to cry. It was so disturbing seeing the man's mouth move and a scared child's voice come out. Eventually the man in a pig mask found a woman dressed as Farmer Casey. She stood at the end of an alley with four other men in various animal masks walking up behind her. Frankie Pig had a knife in his hand, so did the four men behind the woman. The scene then transitions to the farm again. The five men are all stabbing the actress who was portraying Farmer Casey. The author decided to stop watching after that. He did some investigating into the background of the company that made the film, Funbox Entertainment. He found a number associated with their company. The author called and talked to someone about finding their film. They seemed confused as if they'd never heard of it before. They did ask for an address so they could come pick it up though. The author gave them a fake address. He finished the movie, which concluded with the five men throwing the body of former Casey into Niagara Falls. He took the tape to the police and explained everything to them. The final update the author gives is that there was a fire at the fake address that they had given. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked the video, consider subbing to the channel. I put out iceberg videos, internet mysteries, gaming mysteries, and creepypasta related content. At 10k subs, I have a very special video planned for everyone. So hope you all look forward to that. Also, you can follow me on social media. All of those links are in the video description below. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you all have a good night.